Thank you uh, for that very nice introduction. I was pleased to be described as part of the not very taxing portion of the conference. Um, the, uh, that's actually very true. You know, I imagine this is going to be a conference, particularly tomorrow, full of very, very complex, um, complicated analytics. Um, so I thought it'd be a useful counterpoint to all that intellectual sophistication um, for me uh, to make a, just a dumb, obvious point. Um, many people believe that I, uh, uh, that dumb, obvious points are my strengths, and <laughs> I'm always happy to oblige. Um, my dumb, obvious point is that uh, analytics are of no value if you don't have a conversation beforehand about why you want to use a particular analytic. Um, like I said, it's a kind of an obvious point, but um, I worry that we don't have those kinds of conversations. So what do I mean? Well, I'm gonna, what I, what I wanna do, I wanna start by just by playing you a little bit of a clip. It's from an interview that was on the podcast Long Form uh, last week with a woman named Sheila uh, Kohatkar. And she's a, uh, she's a writer. She just came out with a big book on uh, Steve Cohen, the hedge fund trader um, at SAC. And she's talking in this clip about uh, a job that she had as an analyst at a hedge fund, some, somewhere uh, where many of you, some of you may end up, um, in New York City. And if you just play the clip, we can get a, a feeling for her. I mean, it was a really interesting crash course in so many things for me, uh, just sort of gender politics and the unfairness of trying to be a woman in a very male industry and high finance and uh, Wall Street and money and the economy and all this stuff. And I really didn't know anything. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was trying to learn it on the fly, which I did really enjoy in a way. It was this sort of challenge. But um, I kind of knew the whole time that I didn't want to stay in that business. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But the money was really good. So I would kind of, you know, I'd say, oh, I'm going to quit. I'm going to leave. I'm going to do this, that. And then I'd, you know, I'd get a bonus in January. And I'd think, oh, so stupid to walk <laughs> away from this. I should stay. But you know. Um, it was, it was hard though, I wasn't very happy. I wasn't very good at the job, even though I found it sort of interesting to learn about it. It was, um, you know, it required making quick decisions about what to do uh, with other people's money. Uh -huh. And I am a very cautious, careful, thoughtful person. The thought of making a, a mistake actually keeps me awake at night, like it's a really upsetting thought. And so having to just sort of look at the market and look at the news or see something, some development, then have to make a snap decision about should we buy, should we sell. I found that incredibly stressful. And in fact, that is, um, that does not make you a good trader. I mean, the people who do well at those jobs are people who have a huge tolerance for risk and who are not emotional about what they're doing. I mean, you have to be very dispassionate and yeah. kind of cool under pressure. And I was just like a basket case. So, you know, uh, after 9-11, things on Wall Street got pretty bad and I had moved to a slightly larger fund at that point and they just started laying people off and I was one of okay. the first people to go. So on the basis of that clip, what kind of person is Sheila Kohakar? She describes herself as being very cautious, um, incapable of snap judgments and emotional in a way that many of the people around her were not. If we were to analyze her using the big five personality scale, you know, which is extroversion, neuroticism, conscientiousness, openness, um, and disagreeableness. She's clearly really high on conscientiousness. She's super conscientious. That's why she feels so frustrated in a fast-moving environment. And she's neurotic. She worries a lot. She gets stressed out if she, things aren't perfect, right? She can't sleep at night if she can't do her job. That's why uh, she's so unhappy doing that particular job. Um, if you read her book, though, you begin to understand how useful those traits are. She goes after Stevie Cohen, who is the most secretive man in the hedge fund world, and she does uh, an extraordinary job of bringing his world to light. And she, it's a prodigious feat of reporting. I'm a reporter by trade as well, and I know how hard it is. She is several orders of magnitude better at reporting than I could ever be. She's unbelievably dogged. She, goes back four or five, six times to talk to people. She bangs on doors and doesn't give up. She's incredibly dogged. If I had to sum her up using a word that's not uh, in the big five, I would say that she's really slow, by which I mean she does a job uh, as thoroughly as possible, regardless of the clock that's ticking on the wall. 
She's a tortoise, right? She's, in fact, a neurotic tortoise. Um, she covers every inch of the ground, and I think we would all agree that there are times and places where being a neurotic tortoise is really, really valuable. It's what you want, right? You want a neurotic tortoise. So here's my concern. If we really want neurotic tortoises for certain kinds of jobs, particularly jobs that require mastering incredibly complicated worlds and being doing a very thorough job and not making mistakes, which I think would, would be highly suited for the present workplace, um, if we want neurotic tortoises so much, why do we design uh, selection and evaluation systems that are biased against neurotic tortoises? Now, I could go on and on about this since I've, believe it or not, um, at the moment I'm obsessed with the fate of neurotic tortoises. But Adam only gave me 15 minutes, so I'm going to be very brief. I want to give you one example of how we make life difficult for neurotic tortoises, and that's the LSAT. Now, I could just as easily have talked about the SAT or the GRE or the GMAT. I picked the LSAT because I figured there would be very few lawyers in this room, so I could <laughs> safely make fun of it without offending anybody. Um, and I should also make the confession that I've never taken a standardized test before in my life. I have no idea what they're like. But I was doing, working on this talk in the library this week, and this student sees me that I have papers on the LSAT open on the computer, and he gave me a sample test because he was studying for his LSAT, and I tried it, and I got every question wrong. So it's really hard, it turns out, the LSAT. And it's really uh, important, you know, you know this, if you just rank all of the law schools in the country on the basis of their average, of the average LSAT score of their incoming applicants, incoming class, then you get, the, uh, you get the US News ranking. There's no difference. It's essentially when we rank them, that's what we're ranking. So they're really, really, really important and they're really, really hard. So what is the LSAT? Well, to answer that question, I'm gonna have to do a little detour into the theory of test giving. There's a distinction and I'm aware as I make this point that Adam, who is off stage, knows probably 10 times more about this than I do, and so I am setting myself up for some major problems when we sit down and talk, but nonetheless, I'm gonna go ahead. There's a big distinction between speed and power in test giving. So a speed test is a test where all the questions are easy. Anyone can be expected to answer them, but what we're interested in is how quickly you complete it. So most children's card games are speed games. Right? Snap. Did you play Snap as a kid? That's a speed game, right? The underlying task is not difficult. What we want to know is how quickly do you do it. Um, video games. A lot of video games are speed games. They're not, the underlying task is not difficult. On the other hand, power tests are tests where the underlying question is very difficult, difficult. And what we're interested in is not how quickly do you answer it, but how accurately do you answer it. So Scrabble is a power game, at least in the way that it's normally played in my family. It's a speed game. Uh, and a cryptic crossword is a power game. It's not a speed game. We don't care how quickly you do it, or at least some, most of the time. And the reason we separate out power and speed is that they are separate variables. There's a little bit of overlap, but you can be very good at speed and lousy at power, and very, very good at power and lousy at speed, right? And a really good example of this is chess. So chess is a power game, right? It's not a speed game, it's a power game. But we play chess in a variety of ways where we speed it. We place a time constraint. So there's classic chess, which is, I think, 90 minutes for the first 40 moves, then 30 minutes for the balance with 30 seconds per move on the end. That's where we've, it's relatively unspeeded. Then there's rapid chess, which is 10 minutes. And then there's blitz chess, which is like three minutes or however fast you want to do it. And when you do it that way, when you compare the rankings for classic uh, rapid and blitz, you see real differences. So Wesley So is the great up and coming American chess player right now. On classic chess, he's almost as good as Magnus Carlsen. He's pretty much the best player in the world. He's terrible at blitz chess. I want to say terrible. He's not even close to being in the top 10, right? He really, really, on the other hand, there's a, 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 a 24 year old Chinese grandmaster um, named Darren Ling. Darren Ling is not in the top 10 in classic chess. He's 12th, I think. Uh, he's probably never gonna be world champion. However, at blitz, blitz chess, he's fantastic. He was the blitz champion in 2016. He's almost as good as Magnus Carlsen at uh, blitz. 
So if you are, when you combine speed to a power test, we say that the test is speeded. And the point is that when you add speed to a power test, you are not improving the accuracy of the test, right? You're changing what you're measuring. You're mixing two different variables. And when you mix those variables, you're gonna get different outcomes. So who's the best chess player in the world? Well, there is no such thing as the best, best chess player in the world. There's only the best chess player at the, uh, at the particular mix of speed and power that we choose to play in international competition. If we made international competition three minutes, Darren Ling is gonna be the household name. As it stands, because we don't do that, you've never heard of Darren Ling, right? So there's a, arb a built-in arbitrary element to the way in which we evaluate people under power conditions, which is to what extent are we speeding the test? So what is the, LS what is the LSAT? Well, the LSAT is obviously a power test. The questions are really hard. I couldn't answer any of them. In fact, I nearly tore my hair out when I tried to do the practice test in the, L in the LSAT. But it's also speeded, right? When you take the LSAT, you have three hours to do it. You can't take all the time you want. There's a finite amount of time that you're given to answer all 101 questions. And uh, three hours is not long enough for most people who take the LSAT. Most people run out of time, and they end up guessing on the balance of the test. So on the LSAT, we have chosen to evaluate candidates for law school on the basis of uh, power tests given with a speed constraint. So this is my question. Why is the LSAT speeded? Come on, right? explain that to me. You've got a test that's divided up into five parts. Each part has 35 questions. I'm sorry, each, each part is, get, you have 35 minutes to complete each, complete each of five multiple choice sections. Why is there a 35 minute limit? Where did that come from, right? I can understand why we have time constraints on chess. If there was no chess clock, the games would last for weeks. You couldn't watch a chess match. It would be a, you'd need to have to quit your job. You had to be incarcerated to be a chess fan. It would go on for so long. Totally makes sense to me that you'd want to impose a time constraint on a power game when it comes to a spectator sport, right? The LSAT is not a spectator sport. Why on earth is it speeded? Right? I don't get it. What is it about the legal profession that suggests that a speedy constraint on a power test is a good idea? So let's go back to Sheila Kohakar, our uh, neurotic tortoise. And I want to imagine her taking the LSAT. So I have, I'm very bad at PowerPoint. Let's see if this works. Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, here we have a hare and a tortoise. Uh, Sheila is on the right, she's our neurotic tortoise, and Hare is some super quick, bright uh, character. So uh, Hare, let's start with Hare. Hare uh, attempts all 101 questions. Um, he answers 82 correctly, so he has an accuracy rate of 81.7. He doesn't guess any of them because he manages to finish in time because he's super speedy. His raw score is 82, his L set is 165, 65. He finishes in the 94th percentile. He gets into Penn. He gets a cushy job at Skadden Arps. And no one sees him again until he makes partner at the age of 50. <laughs> uh, OK, neurotic tortoise Sheila comes along. Sheila answers 80 questions correctly because she's terrified of making a mistake and she's getting really stressed out. Um, I'm sorry, she, she attempts 80. She answers 78 correctly. She has an accuracy rate of 97.5%. But she ends up guessing on the last 21 because she runs out of time and she gets a couple of those right. Her raw score is also 82. Her LSAT score is 165. She's in the 94th percentile. She too gets into Penn and ends up at, uh, at uh, Skadden Arps. Now, for this, from the standpoint of the LSAT, the neurotic tortoise and the hare are absolutely identical. They had the same score, right? But that's nonsense. Right? These, are, th these two candidates could not be more different. I mean, think about, for example, if we unspeeded this particular test. It's quite possible that Sheila, our neurotic tortoise, could answer, I don't know, maybe if you gave her enough time, she would have answered 98 questions correctly. Maybe 97. The 
Hare, on the other hand, he's already run through all the questions. He cannot do, he's hit his ceiling at 82. He's done, right? He's not smart enough to handle the remaining 19 questions. But Sheila, I don't know, give her an extra couple of hours. Maybe she turns out to be some kind of LSAT genius. <coughs> so the effect of speeding a power test is not just to make an apple and an orange both look like apples. It's also to potentially obscure our uh, knowledge, our understanding of the neurotic tortoise, who could be really, 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 really good at the particular tasks of being a lawyer. Let me go further. The same bias exists in law school. So in law school, you have your grade uh, consists of three things in general. You're an in-class test, a take-home test, and paper, right, a paper. In-class tests are highly speeded power tests. Take-home tests are moderately speeded power tests. Uh, re exam, um, uh, uh, research papers are pure power. Um, so here we have hare, tortoise, and ordinary Joe. And you can see that hare is going to do really good on the in-class test. It's going to be okay on the take-home, and he's going to be terrible at the, at, the, at, the, at the essay. Tortoise is exactly the opposite. Sheila struggles in in-class. She gets freaked out. She's really neurotic. Take-home, she's okay. And the paper, of course, she nails it. Of course she nails it. Give her a maximum amount of time. She's going to do a really good job. In a situation where we rank, rate all of those three things equally, in class, take home paper, hare and tortoise have exactly the same GPA. But if we're in a law school that chooses to rate in class greater, 50% of the grade in class, hare does better than tortoise. And if you flip it though, and you have a situation where, oh, I'm sorry, and if you're in a, in a school which takes uh, in-class tests really seriously, it makes it 80% of the grade, hair looks like a winner and tortoise looks like a complete loser. Now, I come back to my question. Who is actually the better lawyer based on those two proxies? Who's a better candidate for the legal profession? Well, I don't know based on those two things, their LSAT score or their uh, GPA, because I, I need to know to what extent you have rated uh, power versus speed in your evaluation, right? And until we have a conversation about what we want from the legal profession and what we want a lawyer to look like, we don't know how to accurately rate those three things when it comes to evaluating uh, legal students um, in uh, their, uh, uh, in their uh, when they're in law school. Um, now, why haven't we had this particular conversation? Why, haven't, why hasn't the legal profession sat down and said, uh, are we more interested in tortoises or hares, right? Should we be speeding or unspeeding the way that we evaluate students? I don't know the answer to that question. It puzzles me. For, for I've been trying to get someone in the legal profession to tell me why they speed the LSAT and why they uh, wait in class exams as much as they do. Because everything that I understand about the legal profession tells me that I think I would want a neurotic tortoise when it comes to doing my legal work. The best answer I, can, I have managed to come up with in talking to people about why, we, uh, why the LSAT is speeded is that's the way they've always done it. At some point in the 19th century, some guy decided, well, let's give them three hours and we've stuck with that ever since, right? Which suggests to me that um, this is, it may be all very well and good for us to have an analytics conference here in Philadelphia, but I would be happier if a week before we had an analytics conference, we had a conference where we sat down and had a conversation about the kind of analytics that we're interested in. Thank you. We are so low tech that we're gonna record right here from Tripod. So, Malcolm, um, great to have you here at the Wharton People Analytics Conference. Thank you. I noticed you have less hair than last time you came. Was that deliberate? Um, I have, uh, well, I was talking about relative to you or relative to my, <laughs> previ <laughs> my previous, relative to my previous hair state, yes. Okay, uh, I'll have some data questions about that later, but. You just told us that we should be thinking about slowing down standardized tests, like the LSAT or the MCAT or the GRE or any of them. Or 
if we don't, we should at least explain why we're not slowing them down. And okay. Give me, a, give me a, a reason why you want to speed a power test before speeding a power test. I have some reasons. You want to hear them? Yes. Okay, disclaimer first though. One of the things I love most about your work is how you push all of us to question our own assumptions. And so I feel that the most respectful way to have a conversation with you is to challenge your assumptions. Okay. Are we good with that? Yes. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, first of all, the reason that I want the standardized test to be short, whether I'm looking at students or job applicants, is because we already have long power tests. They're called grades. And so if a student gets to spend four years accumulating those grades, why in the world now do we need yet another tortoise contest? Uh, well, there's an additional reason. So we have uh, LSATs and uh, SATs and GREs are not uh, knowledge tests, classically speaking. They're cognitive evaluations, right? So we're trying to get at something that is different from grades even if we unspeed them. So in that sense, I, I guess what I'm interested in as a pure cognitive evaluation, why are we biasing in, in favor of the hair? Um, I'm interested in the kind of, 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 of measuring the kind of pure cognitive strength that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that shows its face under pure power conditions. Okay. Particularly for pure power professions. Cool, I like that. However. In psychology, we have this distinction between typical and maximum performance. Typical performance is basically how well do you do on your usual day. Maximum is how good are you at your best. And those two measures tend to correlate pretty highly. So that the higher your maximum performance, also the higher your typical performance. Which leads me to think that although there might be some really, really brilliant tortoises um, and also some less brilliant hares, um, that most of the time the two go hand in hand and that processing speed is also a proxy for you know, the complexity of information you can handle. So if that's the case, do we really need to tease the two apart for the rare people who fall in one of the off-diagonals? I was surprised when I started, you, uh, as I uh, pointed out in my talk, you know 10 times more than this than I do, but I was surprised when I was reading up on this recently, the extent to which psychometricians insist that speed and power are separate quantities. Um, now, it is additionally the case that uh, you don't, uh, when you move from a, my understanding is when you move from a speed of power test to a pure power test, you don't necessarily change the shape of the curve, but you do jumble um, the, the rankings of people on the curve. And it's that jumbling that interests me. So maybe the jumbling, if you look at, for example, on the chess, if you compare classic versus splits chess rankings, top 20 players in the world. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of difference, but there are these cases, so in, of those 20 players, there's maybe four who have dramatically different um, classic rankings as blitz rankings. Darren Ling being one of them, Wesley So being another. Mm -hmm. And then there's weird cases like uh, Magnus Carlsen, the greatest player in the world, who is marginally the best at classic chess and so far and away, the more you speed it up, the more he becomes dominant. So there's two things going on here. One is that when I arbitrarily add in a speed component, I, I start to lose at the margins. I may have a general sense of what's going on, but I'm missing people, and I'm obsessed with missing people. And the second thing is it obscures my understanding of what makes someone good. So you learn a lot about Magnus Carlsen when you look at his performance under different speedy conditions, you understand what is brilliant about him as a chess player is that he doesn't make mistakes even when, you, when the game is going like that, right? That's a really interesting observation about it. Yeah, it is. And so I, I can see the rationale for that. I guess it just seems like in most complex jobs, it's not quite as independent, right? So like in, in your old running days, um, the fastest sprinter is never going to be the best marathoner or vice versa. Um, but I think in general, the more expert somebody is at the job, um, I read something once about 10,000 hours, which we'll talk about too. And you know, the more, the more expert you are, right, the less you have to rely on sort of slow system two thinking, the more that your fast, intuitive, visceral heuristics are accurate, um, which I also read about in another book um, that you might have blinked at once or twice. And with all that in mind, shouldn't we just assume most of the time that the experts are going to be the, well, but, the fastest? Uh, but, but hold on, I chose the legal profession for a reason. You did. And I chose it for a reason because I think this is one 
example where that, um, that relationship between speed and performance starts to break down. Yep. I absolutely do not want a speed reading lawyer. So the, the kind of person who, when I, and I played that Sheila Kohatkar uh, clip for a reason as well, that mindset of, there is a woman who is incapable of being fast. So she has a, she has a personality constraint on speeding up. She can't sleep at night, she worries, she can only be dogged and thorough. In her chosen profession of being uh, uh, an investigative reporter, that is absolutely central. You cannot be a speed reading investigative reporter, right? Doesn't work. Right? If you're someone who doesn't want to go back the fifth time, you're never going to get that kind of story. So there are specific moments, in other words, when we have to understand that the cognitive um, um, uh, uh, profile of the profession is different. Um, my father was a mathematician. There's no upside for him being fast. He might publish, uh, a great mathematician might publish, you know, 10 great papers in their lifetime. Why does it matter whether they, why would we want to reward a mathematician who wrote his paper in six months as opposed to two years? Okay. I think you answered your own question in an article you wrote a while ago, uh, which, which actually said that the more output you produce, also the better your shot at stumbling onto greatness. Um, you actually said that the more bad ideas you have, yeah. the better you will be. And so don't we actually want to reward speed to get to quality? Not in a lawyer. Not in a lawyer. Right. So now, see, you're, 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 I know the game you're playing, and I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm but, trying to play a speed game. Come yeah, on. But you are, you are, you're not listening to me, Adam. <laughs> I'm being very specific about lawyers. The lawyer cannot, the lawyer, we do not want the high output, lots of error lawyer. I'm sorry, you what were the, you saying? <laughs> no, <laughs> just go on. We, I wasn't listening for real, but now I'm listening. <laughs> okay. okay, so why do we want lawyers who Can are Can you slow? imagine the lawyer who came to you and said, uh, so here's the contract, uh, take a look. If it turns out it's not the right thing, we, we can just go back and do another version later. Are you kidding me? That's a, that's a disaster. I'm reminded, you know, that, you know that story in the financial crisis where someone puts the comma in the wrong place and they end up paying, you know, well, I forgot, $20 a share for layman and not $2 a share? Who was the person who read that document at 2 in the morning? The hair. It wasn't Sheila Kohatkar. She would be the one who'd read it five times. Why? Because she'd be petrified that she put the comma in the wrong place. There are specific, you know, or the person who is uh, uh, in any kind of high stakes job where the penalty for error is high, you can't afford to have hairs. So it's, what I'm objecting to is the very thing that you're talking about, which is you're trying to make a general set of principles about selection. And I think you can't make a general, I think you have to be much more specific in saying, um, and not only, by the way, there are parts of the law where I might want a hair. So what I want the legal profession to say is, for this kind of law and this kind of law and this kind of law, I want the neurotic tortoise. For this kind of law, I want the hair. And I want them to say, okay, so let's create a safe space for the neurotic tortoise as opposed to penalizing them at the point of entry. I like that a lot for the tortoise. Where I wonder about it is what are the consequences for the people around the tortoise and for the organization? And you, you may not care. Yeah. Um, and I think that's reasonable, right, to, to care more about making sure that people don't get missed than about like, whether a law firm does well. But I think that there, in systems dynamics terms, we can think about equifinality, right? Multiple paths to the same end. And being neurotic is one path to that, right? Like, I, I can relate to that. I remember, like, being afraid when I was studying for tests that, like, I would do so badly that I would not only fail, but my professors would take away points on my previous exams because there's no way I could have earned what I'd gotten before. And that anxiety was really motivating <coughs> for those of us who are defensive pessimists. Yeah. Um, but it's only one route to that thoroughness, right? So you could be really emotionally stable and also incredibly conscientious. And you could be fast, and then you could have that motivation to want to double check and triple check and quadruple check. And so I guess I wonder, do we need, could it just be a really conscientious hare who's fast, who executes, and then is also careful on the that's back like end? Saying, that's like saying, can't we have all basketball players who resemble Michael Jordan? You know, you, you, we can't argue for the perfect form, because the perfect form happens once in a generation. I, I think that if you're going to, if you want, um, highly conscientious, highly neurotic people, they're going to be tortoises, by and large. Um, I mean, remember as well that I'm not saying about removing all speed constraints. So on the breakdown of 
take-home test exam, uh, um, in-class exam, yeah. uh, take-home test essay in-class exam. I'm not saying throw out the in-class exam. I'm just saying be honest and open about why you're weighting the test the way you are and be clear about who you're dis disadvantaging in each instant. I could, I could get on board with that. I then wonder, so if we tie this into deliberate practice, um, and I do want to give you a chance to, to set the record straight on a <laughs> widely misunderstood set of ideas. Um, but as I think about that, I think, okay, you know, you take your Bill Gates argument, for example. Um, one of his real advantages was that he was able to accumulate that practice faster or earlier. Um, and in turn, you know, the hope is that the people who do that then also become extremely thorough, right? And I'm wondering how you think about that. So the, the people who do rack up more practice and, and therefore more expertise are probably going to be mostly speed people. And what do you do to, to even the score there after selection and admissions? Yeah. Well, so computer programming, the li I know just a little tiny bit about that. And the little tiny bit I know suggests to me that people who are the 90th percentile computer programmer is not just uh, better. Um, that is to say, writes better code, but she is uh, faster and makes fewer errors. So there's a case where I don't think mm -hmm. there's a neur neurotic tortoise component. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it appears to be that the hair is what you want, um, or at least the if you're good, you're going to be a hair. You can be a bad hair, but if you're good, you're going to be being a, being fast goes hand in hand with being accurate and creative and mm -hmm. um, so that might be a different, um, uh, in fact, the more, it's funny, because I've just started digging into this thing, and the more, I'm impressed more and more with how different disciplines have, how different their kind of ideal profiles are. Um, and uh, I mean, this is part of a kind of larger argument for us being much more accepting of difference mm -hmm. when it comes to selection for certain sorts of, of, um, of, uh, of domains. One of the things I worry about there is as we, okay, so let's say we could profile every job, which mm -hmm. there are people in the room who have been working on this very problem. Then we end up in a situation where we're really good at selecting for individual job performance, and we're terrible at selecting for the qualities that would make for a uh, high-performing culture or a team with diverse skills and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, what extra layers do you want to add in then? for the second thing, for high-performing teams and... Yeah, as, as we think about not just optimizing my own individual contributions, but also, yeah. you know, what's, what's, the, what's the sum of the parts? Well, why isn't, uh, why isn't it good enough to say that uh, if I have a condition that allow, a, an environment that allows individuals to maximize their potential, that will ultimately be for the best of the... Let's take, a, let's take an example um, in, a, in a university faculty, such as you belong to. Um, as a writer, my principal observation about why other writers fail is that they are in too much of a hurry. I don't think you can write a good book in two years. You may dis dis disagree. You have done that, I think, but you're an anomaly. Most, be most of us can't write books that quickly, and we need to be a little bit more tortoisey and a little less hairish. The problem is that the world wants you to be a hare. Your publisher says, I want it now. You're under pressure. to do this X, Y, and Z, you have a one-year sabbatical where you're trying to cram it in and finish, you've got a teaching load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, <coughs> um, even something is some, one thing that almost all of the professional writers I know, so not people who have a day job like yourself, um, do, the very best of them do, is that they write drafts and then they put the, put the book in a drawer for six months and then they come back to it. They build in, they turn themselves into tortoises, force themselves to slow down and go back. Um, now does that, that in a sense harms the system in that the amount of output is lowered, but I don't think the problem with writing in America right now is a failure of output. I think it's a failure of quality, right? Um, so there's a case where I think the overall system could use maybe a little lower level of, of, um, of production and some, higher production values. Um, and I think that having individual writers who write better books makes us all better. Now, that doesn't really answer your question because you're talking, I think, about much more coherent organizations. But is The New Yorker a better organization if writers slow down and write fewer articles in a year, but those articles are very memorable? 
I think if you did a, a systematic analysis of the financial health of the New Yorker, you would learn that it, th it's, the New Yorker is a hit-driven enterprise that probably eight articles a year account for 90% of people's interest in the, um, in the product. And so that to the extent you can encourage people to write fewer hits, you're better off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the academic cheat on this is by the time you write a book, you've already been working on the topic for five or 10 years. And so a lot of the tortoise so, work happened up front, right? Yes, that's the right. research part of it, yeah. um, which doesn't guarantee that the book will be sensible or um, even understandable. But I, I, do, um, I do wonder then, so give, give us a, a chance to update the thinking on, okay, so you know, 10,000 hours, probably it might be your most widely discussed uh, bit of writing. Um, I think arguably the most misunderstood as well. What would you actually like us to conclude about expertise and deliberate practice? Uh, well, as I have explained many times, and no one here is interested in listening, I was only I was <laughs> interested in that because I was interested in the idea that if it takes you a long time to master something, longer than you would imagine, then that must mean that you need a lot of help, A, and B, that you must be in a situation that's patient. That's what interested me was the context that if, if we're all naturals, then the context in which we perform what we do is irrelevant, right? If you're born being able to, to, uh, to be a scratch golfer, then why do we need you know, uh, to spend money developing young golfers? It's all there, right? Um, but once you understand, actually, not only does it take a long time to get good, even if you're really incredibly talented to begin with, um, but it takes a, an incredibly long time, then you understand, oh, not even Roger Federer could be a great tennis player without a coach, without a place to go and play tennis, without parents who drive him there, without people who, remember Roger Federer for years and years and years was known for having a terrible te temper. And it's really just, if you go back, sorry to get a little Roger Federer riff here, but the great, at the beginning of his career, he was thought to be someone who would never amount to true greatness because he didn't have the right, pers the requisite personality. He would have these meltdowns. He would throw his racket, he would storm off the court, and they were like, ugh, another one of these people who's gonna squander his talent. But that's just because we were observing him in the middle of his necessary period of ten tennis apprenticeship, and he, once he had completed that, he turned into the tennis player we know, someone who is, whose control of his emotions is perhaps as good as anyone who's played the game, right? So even Roger Federer required a patient ecosystem to become truly great. That's all I was trying to get at. I, 10,000 hours, I mean, it's a number that has been thrown around by a number of people who were looking at musicians, which I just thought was intriguing, mm -hmm. but it was never meant to be a kind of definitive, um, and nor was it meant to be a statement that talent didn't matter. It was that talent re talent requires a lot of time to be, um, you know, I can spend 10,000 hours at any number of things and I will never be any more than mediocre. Yeah, and I guess in turn, the role that luck and opportunity played in, in making that possible yeah, is, is a huge part of the story. So we have audience questions, uh, which I would love to, to throw some of them your way. Um, one of them is you're, you're harsh on standardized tests because of what they're missing and the maybe arbitrary or artificial performance standards that are missing key skills that might be relevant for a job or personality traits for that matter. Um, what else is being rewarded that we shouldn't be measuring? Like, can you afford to take an LSAT prep class? And how do we get that out of the system? Well, a really good way to get out of the system would be to dump standardized tests entirely. Uh, you know, they're, they're the contribution for all the fuss that this country, <coughs> when I say this country, a lot of other countries don't have standardized tests. I mean, it's not, it is not a given that human beings need to conduct their entry uh, to elite institutions this way. Um, I don't understand why people are so obsessed with them given the fact that their actual predictive usefulness is small. I mean, grades are a way better use. Uh, SAT scores give you a little bit of bump past grades but there are actually all kinds of other tests that do a better job of this than the SAT. I mean, it, it, the mythology around this test, it's almost, it's not a, it, it's almost like there's a kind of fetish for these things in American society, which as an outsider, I find incredibly puzzling. But sure, yeah, you, now you've got a system where people are hiring coaches at enormous costs in order to improve their 
score on a test that doesn't really matter all that much in the end. I mean, it, we are now at a level of absurdity with this particular game. Why don't you just call a halt to it? I'm, I'm, I'm sick, of, in other words, of trying to fix the system. I think it's time just to dump the system. Just to say, why this is just the, it's, it's a great, if we were starting from, the, the question we ought to ask ourselves is, if we were starting the American educational system from scratch tomorrow, would we have the SAT? And the answer is, of course we wouldn't. So why are we persisting in the charade? So I have, a, I have a thesis, or at least a hypothesis, which is I think we're, we're in the charade because it creates an illusion of certainty. Mm -hmm. And it allows those of us who make selection decisions to believe that there are more deserving and less deserving or more qualified and less qualified candidates, um, which I think is largely an illusion. Um, but if we throw the system out altogether, we're still gonna be looking for sources of certainty. How do you tackle the more fundamental problem of people having to sit and admit that what they do every day in sorting and selecting and betting on applicants is basically throwing darts and that you know there's there's basically a lottery running there whether they like Why it or not. Why not just run the lottery? Well our, uh, our mutual friend Barry Schwartz suggested we should do I that. totally agree with him. I mean I think that's the, one of the smartest things. Have a cutoff. Say that uh, if I'm a, I'm at you know I'm Penn I'm interested in order to apply for Penn you must be in the top 10 percent of your class. Um, and you must do one interesting thing on the side. Uh, and then, uh, then we're gonna throw all those names in a hat and pull them out. I mean, I can tell you with 100% certainty the freshman class at Penn under those circumstances would be infinitely more interesting than it is now. <laughs> I'm glad we have no, no freshmen in the room. <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, what, <laughs> what that surfaces for me is a lot of things. Uh, the one that, that I want to follow up on, though, is there's still going to be some arbitrariness in where you draw the cutoff. And yeah. so the, the, you're, you're never going to end up at a complete lottery with what you called elite institutions. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to design your own selection system, what would you put in it that you think is less arbitrary than the alternatives on the table today? I would, uh, I thought about this actually, that to me the, and this actually has a, a good deal of relevance for recruiting to organizations as well. Um, the conversation is too one-sided. So <coughs> if you read the literature on what makes for a meaningful college experience, um, almost all of that literature stresses the, the, the role of the, the way the student interacts with their institution. That is, when I show up on campus on day one, how do I behave? Do I seek out the most interesting professors to me and take their classes? Do I join? If I'm interested in music, do I join the band? Do I go out for cross country? Do I, do I willingly throw myself into the experience or do I smoke dope in my room, right? Um, that, the variable is you, not the institution. And we have somehow lost that fact. So if I'm an institution, what I'm really interested in, ought to be in, is what does the individual want from me? So I would say, when you write a, instead of writing an essay, a, that talks about what happened in your own life and the institution says, oh, I like that and that and that. Flip it. The essay should be, what do I want from my college education? Who would I, if you're MIT, the cream of the cream, right? Or you're Harvard or whatever, you should say, someone who's applying to your school should be able to say with a certain degree of specificity which professor they would like to study with and why. And if you, if you're not at that stage in your intellectual development, then don't go to those schools, because that's what those schools are for, right? Go to a place where if you wanna, if, and if you wanna join a frat and party, you should say, my int principal interest is joining a frat and partying, and as a result, I would like to go to Duke. <laughs> joke, 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 joke. But I mean, the point is you can, that institutions ought to have clear personalities and ought to recruit those people who are interested in that kind of thing, right? If I'm Carnegie Mellon and I have maybe the greatest robotics faculty in the world, what I wanna know is if you're applying to Carnegie Mellon, if you're into robotics, why? What would you do if you came here? Come and, did you come last year and sit in a robotics class and what did you think, right? How do you see yourself, you know, have you read stuff by any of the professors at Carnegie Mellon and if so, what did you think of the stuff that you read? That's Relevant, what are you gonna do when you get here is the question I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Do you want companies to do the same? I do, uh, I think they do 
do that to some extent. I think they do a better job than colleges at yeah. doing that. Um, it, this is one of many areas where I think the, the uh, public, where, where education can learn from the private sector. But I feel like there are situations where, um, I mean, we asked that question in a very vague way. What, how do you see yourself in five years? Which is too far in the future, I think, generally. But, um, but I think, yeah, more, to the extent we, should, we, do, we, we could do more of that, we should. If I'm an employer and I really want to take your argument seriously, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I'm not privileging speed over power, where do I start? An employer. Uh, well, that's interesting. I guess I would like to see, I mean, I'm, I am the millionth person to say this, um, that the ultimate um, uh, uh, version of speed versus power, it's not a, 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 a a perfect fit here, but um, that apprenticeships or tryout trial periods um, are a version of power over speed, right? I'm removing the time constraint on making my evaluation, and I'm saying, if you would like to come, why don't you just come, and why don't we all just see how things go over a period of weeks or months? I, I've all, always, my um, brother, who is an elementary school principal in Canada, like every, and all effective principals try to do this, which is when they hire a teacher, they try to get a teacher on a contract before they offer them mm -hmm. tenure, because they, they, think, they think that they understand the best way to evaluate whether a teacher is a good teacher is to actually watch them teach for a while. Mm -hmm. The longer, the better. My brother never offers uh, tenure to anyone that he hasn't observed first, and luckily he's in a system that allows him to do that, right? So, I mean, to the extent that we can, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be weird for you to go and spend six months in an institution, at the end of the day, you and the institution to say, it's not, it's not working. That shouldn't be a black mark on your resume at all. That should just be, that should actually be a positive mark. It says that you should, you're brave enough to experiment, to go out in the world and try stuff. And that's actually a spirit we like here. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of, of stretching out the time horizon for work samples. Um, it does raise the question, though, of we have good evidence that people who job hop more often tend to be less loyal, less committed, less likely to be good citizens. And so you know, if, if that's now a sign that you're willing to experiment. But this isn't job, I think this is a different category than job hopping. In fact, the end goal of this kind of, um, these kinds of experiments is, I would think, to, um, uh, to end job hunting. That's say, if I can do a better job of fitting you with the organization, you're less likely to leave me, not more. So it's not a sign of someone's underlying happy feet if they do three experiments in a row. It's a sign of their desire to be the opposite of someone with happy feet, to try to find a, a new home, yeah, a real home. I can see that, I like it. Um, I also, there's an interesting question here about, uh, about engineers. And you've actually written recently about how engineers think. Um, you, I did that piece because you told me uh, you turned me on to this brilliant article from Danny, from Danny Goya. Jo Goya? Joya. Joya. I didn't realize that was my fault. It's um, your fault. <laughs> By the way, parenthetically, if you're someone who's a writer, the best, best thing you can do is just have lunch with Adam like once every couple months and he just, and take a pen, paper, just write down everything he says. That's what I do. I've done that on so many occasions. <laughs> it's fantastic. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Strangely, I've never had that experience. Um, but I will, I will say that you uncovered some really interesting insights about how engineers process information. And we're trying to make organizations more evidence-based. We're trying to make them more data-driven. That's what engineers do for a living. Is there anything we can learn from how engineers think as we think about sort of making HR and the world of people more data-driven? Uh, I don't know. I mean, do you, uh, one of the, the most remarkable um, one of the most salient facts about thinking and learning about the culture of engineers, and I would say parenthetically, I grew up in that culture since my father was a civil engineer, um, is that if you're not an engineer, I'm not sure you want to spend a lot of time with engineers. <laughs> my father accepted. Um, there, you know, it's a very, very particular culture. I don't know whether you want to make the world resemble um, engineering culture, I sort of think what you want to do in that case is to find better ways for these two very different cultures to speak to each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we absolutely need 
engineers to think like engineers, but we absolutely don't want everyone to think that way. Um, and nor do we want the non-engineers to shut down the engineers. We want to sort of have both healthily at the table. Um, I worry a little bit about, um, you know, about, uh, about the hiring process becoming, I'm more worried about it becoming too dependent on analytics than I am about it not being dependent on analytics enough. I wish there was a little more humility about um, what can and can't be um, measured. Uh, you know, the, you know, in, I follow this most closely in sports and you can't follow the analytics revolution in say basketball and not, and not simultaneously be thrilled at what we can know and deeply humbled about what we absolutely can't know. I mean, there was a, um, uh, and I've, I've forgotten his name. There was at the center for, there were two uh, European players playing in the Denver Nuggets earlier this year. Neither were playing very well. Um, and the consensus was that maybe they were gonna be, a, they were gonna, one or both of them was gonna wash out. Denver traded one of them, either Nurich or the other guy, to Portland. It is now the case that both are playing unbelievably well. All that was necessary in one case was for the other guy to leave town, and in the second case was for the other guy to just to go to a different team, to Portland as opposed to Denver. And all of a sudden now they're talking about him as one of the best centers in the league. Um, if you can find any analytic that helped you predict that outcome, be my guest. It was an intangible. It was, they weren't happy together. And apart, they're fantastic. Um, and that, when I look at the example of, the basketball fans in this room will know, Nurich and who's the other guy? Yes. Um, the, the, that just tells you that there's an awful lot that we can't um, easily understand about human performance. I completely agree with that assessment. Um, I think we could probably you know, reduce our false positive and false negative rates you know, more than we currently do. Um, what I like, though, about bringing engineering discipline to the table is uh, you're not a big fan of the Myers-Briggs as one example. Um, engineers look at that and say, who made this up and why can't we do better in half a century of actual social science? And it's much easier than to update broken systems um, with, you know, with better ideas. Um, do you see more of that? to come in the world of analytics? And how do we do that while maintaining humility? Uh, wow. Uh, do I see more of that? Well, I'm not in, you know, my, if you have a historical perspective on the use of analytics, you tend to be somewhat pessimistic about their intelligent use. Because it strikes me that there's just so much overwhelming um, laziness in the way we use metrics um, to, um, uh, to analyze success. Some of that laziness is being um, uh, confronted with the current generation, but, but I'm, you know, is that just a case where in every new generation makes up its new, met new metric and then goes to sleep and accepts that unquestionably until the next generation comes? I mean, I don't know, I, it's like, in other words, I'm not terribly impressed with the, with the ability of human beings to be, um, uh, consistently self-critical about the value of the analytics they use to make sense of the world. I mean, we are still clinging to gross, to GDP as a useful measure of how well we're doing as a country. If you poke into that, that is bananas. I mean, it's about as lame a measure that you could possibly use to tell how well we're doing, right? So like, but yet, it's the first thing that's, that's quoted when it comes to when we have a when we use an analytic to assess the the the, the how how good our performance as a country is, it's crazy. Um, uh, so I mean I'm not you know I, the, I, I, I forgive me if I'm not if I'm not a, uh, optimistic about how well this will go in the future. I think it's an important sobering note, and it also levels the playing field a little bit, so that it's not just lawyers and dukies who feel a little bit hurt by commentary, everybody has a everybody. reason to yes. question themselves. Um, with that aside, Malcolm, it's, it's been a real treat to have you here. Um, there are tons of people in this room, myself included, who got into this field in large part because of your work, and we're all really grateful that you continue to do it. So we're gonna head to the cocktail reception now. Thank you.
Thank you.